Hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm really looking forward to talking to you about my research, both historically and the more recent work. So without any further ado, let's get started. OK, here we are. So this is a photo of Henry Malayason, uh, probably the most famous case study in neuropsychology. Uh, HM, as he was uh, known, um, we had bilateral uh, removal of part of the temporal lobes, including the hippocampus, uh, by William Scoville in 1953 uh, to deal with his intractable epilepsy. Now, Brenda Milner uh, had an opportunity to study HM, uh, who uh, was clearly having some uh, rather remarkable memory problems, and she discovered that he had great difficulty laying down any new memories. Now, the paper she published in 1957 with William Scoville remains a classic in neuroscience. Now, I feel a, a special connection with Brenda, um, not only because we were both uh, born in the UK and then came to Canada, uh, but also because her graduate student, Doreen Kamira, supervised me when I trained as a clinical neuropsychologist in the 1980s. So in some way, uh, I am Brenda's uh, academic grandchild. In fact, uh, I was absolutely thrilled to be invited uh, to uh, Brenda's uh, centenary, celebrating her 100th birthday in uh, the fall of 2018. And indeed, um, Brenda will be 103. She's still going strong. She'll be 103 this July. Quite remarkable. I feel another connection with Brenda as well. And that is, uh, just like her, uh, my career has been tied up uh, to some degree with a single case. And that case, of course, is DF, patient DF. Uh, and uh, more about her later. But she really uh, provided uh, a real insight uh, into uh, our understanding, the understanding that David Milner and I put forward in an article in Trends in Neuroscience in 1992 of the organization of the visual pathways in the human brain, in the primate brain. Um, we argued that the visual system that allows uh, you out there in Zoom land to recognize the objects in this photo, uh, the, uh, the pencil, wristwatch, uh, the, you know, the cup and so on, and to recognize that it's a picture, that uh, that visual system uh, is um, quite different from the one that allows the actor uh, in the picture to reach out and pick up the cup. That uh, fundamentally different transformations are involved and different uh, anatomical pathways are engaged. And indeed in that article, we argue that you could map this distinction between vision for action and vision for perception onto the two prominent pathways that arise in early uh, visual cortex uh, and project uh, to other parts of the cerebral hemispheres. Uh, one pathway uh, going uh, up to the posterior parietal cortex, the uh, dorsal stream, uh, we argued was important for transforming visual information uh, into the required coordinates uh, for acting on the world. Of course, uh, the dorsal stream is exquisitely poised to do this with reciprocal connections with premotor cortex and uh, projections down to the brain stem to uh, motor nuclei uh, down there and to the ponti nuclei that connect it with the cerebellum. So that pathway then is a vision for action pathway. The other pathway, which goes ventrally to the occipital temporal cortex, uh, making contact with uh, medial temporal structures, with uh, prefrontal cortex, um, is in a great position to transform the visual information into percepts that can act as foundations for cognitive operations, for planning, for thinking about the world, uh, for talking about the world with other people and so on. Now, patient DF. Uh, over 30 years ago, uh, when she was a young woman in her early 30s, uh, she and her husband were uh, renovating a home uh, and she was having a shower in uh, a, a bathroom in which the water heater was improperly vented and she was overcome with carbon monoxide. Uh, and when she uh, went into um, a coma uh, at the hospital, she was found fortunately before she, before she died, um, it was clear that she had uh, real visual problems. Um, now we now know on the basis of MR that was taken, um, uh, this is, uh, was taken around 2003, um, the structural MR uh, images. And what you can see is that she has bilateral damage in the ventral stream uh, in an area LO, the lateral occipital region on both sides of her brain that is known to play an important role in the recognition of object shape. Uh, 
So the problem that Diet had was visual form agnosia. She couldn't recognize objects on the basis of their form or shape. Uh, and this couldn't be explained by appealing to low level visual deficits. Here's Diet uh, catching a ball uh, in her back garden. This video was taken long ago in the uh, early 1990s. And what you can see is that she does remarkably well for someone who really can't tell the difference between a sphere and a cube. When she's tested with objects like this, this inexpensive flashlight on a tabletop, a real flashlight, um, and she'll say things like this. It's made out of metal. Is it aluminum? It's got red plastic on it. In other words, she can identify the surface features, the, uh, the color and so on, um, and, and the material properties from them. But um, she has great difficulty accessing information about shape. So she makes an educated guess. You know, is it some sort of kitchen utensil? Clearly wrong. But when you put the uh, flashlight in her hand, she knows exactly what it is. Uh, she calls, oh, it's an electric torch, a flashlight. So her deficit is uh, one where if you show her something like this, a kind of, you know, object stroop or visual joke, uh, for her, it's not particularly funny. It's a tiger and that's that. She doesn't see the shape of the rabbit. Now her deficit is so profound that when you hold up a pencil in front of her, and she might say it's, it's yellow, uh, is it a pencil? She can't tell the orientation of the pencil. So she can't tell whether it's vertical or horizontal or on a slant. Uh, and um, it, it, it's really quite remarkable that her deficit is, is just so deep that the simple orientation of an object is unavailable to her. And yet on one day she said, let me see that. And she reached out to grab the pencil. This was in early days. And oh my goodness, her hand was oriented in the correct orientation. She was able to uh, rotate her hand in flight to match the orientation uh, of the pencil. So in some sense, uh, her, that part of her brain that controls her hand has access to orientation information uh, that uh, somehow uh, she as a perceiving human does not have. Now, when we reach out to pick up objects, uh, we not only orient our hand correctly in flight, but we also open the, uh, our hand, our grasp, uh, to accommodate to the size of the object in a scaled manner. So that when we reach out to pick up a graduate cylinder, for example, our hand does not open as wide as when we uh, reach out to, to uh, pick up a beaker. And so we decided to test DF uh, on this uh, ability to scale one's hand uh, to the size of a goal object or the width of a goal object. And to do this, we use these uh, uh, so-called Ephron blocks uh, that were developed by uh, Robert Ephron to study actually Mr. S, uh, a famous uh, apperceptive agnosic or uh, uh, visual form agnosic. Uh, he didn't use real blocks. He used uh, shapes that had the uh, same overall area, but uh, different dimensions. But at any rate, these three-dimensional versions we presented to DF. And we asked her either uh, to grasp the Ephron block across its width or to give a perceptual report, uh, a manual estimate. I think it's about this big, holding her in index finger and thumb apart to match the width of the, uh, of the block. Now, when she did this, uh, we recorded uh, the movements of her finger and thumb uh, as, she, uh, as she produced either the estimate or the grasp. Now, grasping uh, was essentially normal uh, in DF. She opened her hand wider in flight for the wide object than she did for the, uh, for the, for the narrow one. Uh, and, uh, and yet, when you look at her uh, estimates, her estimates are, are all, all over the map. She shows enormous trial to trial variability, uh, sometimes opening her hand very wide and sometimes uh, not very wide at all. Uh, and of course, she couldn't describe the uh, width of the objects uh, uh, either or, or discriminate between them. So DF had damage in her ventral stream. What about individuals who have damaged in, uh, who have damage in the stream that's spared in DF, in, dors in the dorsal stream? So we had an opportunity to test uh, a woman in her late 50s who had had two strokes separated by a week, um, which were uh, in her posterior parietal cortex, in her dorsal stream. So uh, here's uh, the damage in her right hemisphere. Here's the damage in her left. And we tested her on exactly the same task that we tested DF on. And what we found was that uh, 
she had no problem uh, well, telling the Ephron blocks apart verbally. Uh, she had no problem describing the width in inches or centimeters. And uh, when she estimated the size using her index finger and thumb, she also opened her hand wider in that estimate for the wide object compared to the narrow one. On the other hand, when she reached out to grasp the object right in front of her, uh, she opened her hand very wide, splaying her hand, as it were, until she made contact. So she showed this behavior uh, where she didn't show any kind of mapping uh, of her hand onto the shape of the object until she touched it and then her hand closed around it. So uh, this is what um, uh, neuropsychologists live and die for, uh, a double dissociation where you've got an individual with damage in one part of the brain, the ventral stream, uh, who has profound deficits in object vision, uh, but can use the uh, very properties that uh, they can't see consciously uh, to actually control their action. And on the other hand, you have a pa patients with damage in the dorsal stream uh, who can perceive the um, shape of objects, but can't use that information to control skill actions. Now, you know, double associations are great uh, and they are persuasive, uh, but uh, many people have pointed out since Teuber first uh, uh, coined the phrase in, in 1955, that they're not really that definitive. Uh, there could be other reasons why uh, you get these dissociations other than modularity of the kind I'm describing. So really what you need is converging evidence. And um, one of the ways in which this can be done is uh, with the advent of fMRI is to look at uh, the activity in the brains of patients like DF um, and see how it maps on uh, to the behavior that one has tested. I, uh, this is uh, put forward uh, this idea uh, very nicely in a recent review paper, so recent it's not coming out until August uh, of this year uh, by Streis and Trammell. So we brought uh, DF uh, to Canada and we uh, scanned her brain in our four Tesla magnet that we had at the time. And this was work led uh, by my colleague, Jody Cullum, uh, and my then graduate student, Tom James, uh, who's now a prof at Indiana University. So the first thing we did was to uh, look at uh, activation in the brain uh, for uh, line drawings or uh, grayscale renderings of objects compared to scrambled versions of them. So here we see um, a neurotypical observer or a graduate student uh, who's in the uh, scanner looking at uh, uh, either of these intact pictures or scrambled versions. And this is the differential activation that one sees in the lateral occipital region. Uh, and of course, uh, this has been uh, demonstrated many times uh, since Rafi Malik first uh, um, uh, demonstrated it. And uh, people like Nancy Kamwisher, Grill Specter, ourselves have have routinely uh, shown that this area is reliably activated uh, differentially when people look at uh, uh, pictures of objects versus scrambled versions. Now, this is DF's brain. You can see the enlarged sulci uh, all over her brain, which are uh, consistent with um, uh, people uh, who have had carbon monoxide poisoning. But you can also see the yellow lesion that I showed you before. And it, uh, I think, neatly encompasses the L uh, area LO that's activated uh, in the uh, in the uh, neurotypical observer's brain. And, you know, it, it, it really does, I, I, I think, illustrate uh, why she's having such a problem. Because you take a scan, uh, you know, a, a slice through there, uh, through, through that lesion, uh, and what you can see is that although, as I said, she has enlarged sulci uh, over her brain, uh, consistent with C uh, carbon dioxide poisoning, both uh, the right and the left hemisphere uh, show loss of tissue uh, in region uh, LO. Uh, so there's real damage there. So what happens uh, when we take LO and we show her the same line drawings versus scrambled versions? Um, well, the, uh, the upshot is there is no activation uh, to speak of in her brain, no differential activation for line drawings uh, versus scrambled versions. And of course, she can't identify the line drawings either. However, if you take uh, activity from a, a, a normal observer uh, and you map that mathematically onto DF's brain, what you can see is that the activation, uh, differential activation for these uh, uh, line drawings falls very neatly either nearby or in the actual uh, lesions uh, of DF. Uh, so um, I think I've, I, I hope persuaded you that it's a very clear uh, resonance between what we see uh, in both structural and um, fMRI uh, 
uh, an exp a, a, a convergence of the findings we had earlier uh, when we tested her even before the invention of fMRI uh, in uh, the early 1990s on, on uh, uh, identification of pictures and grasping and so on. But what about grasping? What about grasping in the magnet? Now, this is not easy to do. Um, it, it, it's a bit of a heroic effort for both the participant and indeed the experimenter. But Jody uh, has worked very hard on this, Jody Cullum, and she's developed this way in which uh, we can present unique objects on trials using this uh, so called grasp apparatus, uh, which is pneumatically driven, a kind of eight sided drum. And we can present a unique object on each trial in a, in a kind of pseudo random schedule that's backlit uh, with an LED. Uh, and uh, the subject can look at it directly and reach out and, and grab the object. Now, when you do this, um, when you can contrast these uh, grasping movements with just a simple reaching movement where people touch the object with the back of their fingers in an unformed grasp, what you see uh, is more activation for grasping than reaching in this area here in the intraparietal sulcus. Uh, an area that in the monkey, in this anterior region of the intraparietal sulcus, AIP, uh, has been shown to be involved in grasping behavior uh, in the non-human primate. Uh, and we see the same thing uh, in the human as well. Uh, there's a human homolog of AIP that's activated for grasping versus reaching. Well, uh, what about LO? LO, of course, uh, is activated when people look at objects, but no more activated on grasping trials uh, than on um, uh, reaching trials, which means that the computations for grasping must happen you know, in situ uh, in the uh, uh, HAIP, in the uh, anterior intraparietal sulcus, uh, so that uh, the incoming visual information is transformed into the required coordinates uh, uh, to get one's hand uh, on the object and, and pick it up. So what happens now when DF um, picks up objects uh, in the magnet, when she grasps these objects on the grasp apparatus? Well, despite the fact that uh, there is some evidence of degeneration in the intraparietal sulcus, she shows activation in an area corresponding to AIP um, uh, when she reaches out to grasp the object versus when she reaches for it uh, and only touches it with the back of her fingers. So I, I think this, again, converges very nicely on the behavioral findings that we established much earlier. So we have the behavioral findings. Uh, we have uh, fMRI. We have single unit studies uh, in the non-human primate that have looked at the dorsal and ventral stream. And of course, we have perhaps more controversial evidence uh, in the intact observer uh, in which uh, we show that um, reaching out and grasping objects is less sensitive to contextual illusions uh, than perceptual report. So all of this suggests then, um, and this is ancient history really, uh, that there uh, are pathways in the brain that have uh, different functional um, uh, purposes one, uh, a pathway, the dorsal stream, that's important for action. Another pathway, the ventral stream, that's important for perception. They're highly interactive, of course, in tasks like using a tool where you recognize a tool and select a posture, uh, but then uh, use the dorsal stream, we would argue, in order to get your uh, hand on the object properly and uh, using a just-in-time computation. But you know, this does nevertheless raise uh, a pretty important question, which is why do we need two visual systems? I mean, why couldn't you have just one general purpose visual system that um, serves, subserves both uh, perception and action? Well, I think the answer to that question, you know, like the answer to so many questions really, lies here. This is a glass of beer or a photo of a glass of beer. But if you were in the uh, scene and you backed up, uh, it would still look like a glass of beer, even though the retinal image shrunk. Um, if you crouch down and looked at it, it would still be a glass of beer. Uh, if you lean forward, glass of beer. And of course, if you had too many glasses of beer, maybe the last thing you would see uh, would be this rather top version of the, of the glass of beer, but you would recognize it as such. So what you have here is object constancy. That is, you recognize an object for what it is, independent of its geometric perception or, or projection, rather, on your retina. This is an old idea. It goes back uh, to Helmholtz to the 19th century. Uh, and object constancy, of course, is, is, is wonderful for perception because it means that, you, um, that, that your identification of objects uh, is uh, independent of viewing distance and viewing angle. Uh, 
But of course, it's hopeless for picking up objects. Here, what you have to do is your brain has to compute uh, the relationship between your hand and the goal object, the glass. Uh, it has to compute the size of the uh, glass and indeed the orientation of the handle of the beer glass. So fundamentally different transformations on the incoming visual information must be performed. So what uh, uh, Robert uh, Foley and Rob Whitwell and I uh, put forward in a recent article uh, in Consciousness and Cognition is that if you think about the two visual systems, you have to think about it really in terms of the consumers that it's serving. So the dorsal stream is serving action and uh, performs computations that are quite different uh, than the ventral stream, which is serving perception, uh, erecting these perceptual foundations uh, for cognitive operations. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's where we have been for some time with our account uh, of uh, the relationship between uh, these pathways uh, and the, uh, uh, the systems that they serve. But of course, as we studied DF and other patients' uh, patterns of spared visual abilities and deficits uh, over the years, the more we've begun to realize uh, that the functional organization of these pathways is far more complex and, and in many ways more interesting uh, than we first realized. So if you look uh, at uh, a, a, a standard uh, you know, diagram boxology of the projections to the cerebral cortex, this is the kind of picture you get that the eye projects to LGN, dorsal part of LGN, then to primary visual cortex, V1, uh, and then to the dorsal stream and the ventral stream. But of course, it's much more complicated. There are lots of other projections that uh, also go to the dorsal stream in particular, but also the ventral stream. And of course, there's many other uh, initial sites in the brain where um, the uh, fibers uh, from the retinal ganglion cells actually end up uh, right from the get-go. So uh, we have, for example, uh, you know, the ventral part of the LGN, the pretectum, the um, nuclei of the accessory optic tract, and the hypothalamus, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's uh, uh, these visual inputs actually synchronize uh, our circadian rhythm with the local uh, um, day-night cycle. So let's think about this for a moment. What happened? What would happen if you took away uh, one of the major nodes here, primary visual cortex? Now there's still input uh, via projections to MT plus and also to V2 and V4 to the dorsal stream and indeed the ventral stream as well, although the projections are more thorough to the dorsal stream. So there are projections uh, that uh, a whole series of investigators have uncovered in the last uh, few years uh, that arise from the eye and uh, project, for example, to the interlaminar regions of uh, LGN and from then, uh, from there uh, to MT and, and up to the dorsal stream in particular. There are uh, also projections to V2 and V4 that can reach the ventral, which are part of the ventral stream. There are projections uh, that go to the midbrain, to the sphere folliculus, uh, then to uh, uh, interlaminar regions of LGN and then to MT. There are projections from the colliculus to the pulvinar uh, and uh, well-documented projections from the pulvinar to MT. Uh, and there are projections even in the, uh, 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 from the eye directly to the pulvinar, particularly uh, in the young primate uh, that then project to MT. So, um, there's clearly lots of inputs uh, to the dorsal and ventral stream, the cerebral hemispheres that are independent of V1. And of course, this raises the question about what kinds of visual abilities could survive uh, damage to V1. You know, the question of whether or not the person would have blind sight, uh, the ability uh, to um, respond to stimuli following V1 lesions that you cannot see. And of course, the term blind sight uh, was, um, was coined by the inveterate uh, punster and my postdoc supervisor, Larry Weiskrantz, who sadly passed on a couple of years ago. Uh, blind sight uh, is a remarkable phenomenon. And we had um, have had the opportunity over the last uh, uh, decade or so uh, to study another patient uh, um, who shows a, a remarkable pattern of uh, visual loss and spared visual uh, abilities. And this is a patient who uh, some 20 years ago uh, developed a lung infection and as a consequence uh, suffered uh, respiratory collapse, uh, plunging uh, blood pressure and ended up in a coma for about two months. 
And sometime during that uh, two month period, uh, she must have had a stroke that left her with a very large uh, bilateral infarction in her occipital cortex. Now, uh, since then, uh, she's recovered remarkably well. Um, she's completely blind in static perimetry. She uses a white cane to get around. And she also has riddicks. That is, uh, she can see the movement of things, moving things, uh, but she can't report uh, their shape or their color or other visual properties at all. So here's her brain. Uh, I, I think some of you might be, uh, who've, who've seen these kinds of slides before, might be quite shocked at how large her lesion is. Uh, she has uh, complete uh, um, uh, damage to V1 and almost all the ventral stream. There's some sparing of parahippocampal uh, cortex here in the right hemisphere. In this coronal section, we can see that uh, despite the huge lesions, uh, as I said, involving V1 in the ventral stream, there's still spared tissue uh, in the very anterior regions of the calcarine fissure, probably um, uh, including things like the prostriata and perhaps uh, the very, very peripheral um, parts of, uh, of V1, although, uh, as I said, she's blind in, uh, in, in static golden perimetry. And in this horizontal section, we can also see that there is some damage uh, in the very posterior regions of the dorsal stream as well, at the junction of the occipital and parietal cortex. So, big lesions. Here's um, here's MC. Oh, that's the real one, but see, I never realized that until I caught it. <clears throat> She's Scottish from Glasgow. So how does MC do uh, when she has to report the dimension of static objects? So clearly, as I said, she has riddick. She could see those uh, balls and she could, uh, um, although she couldn't identify their size or, um, uh, or, or, or one would imagine her, their width uh, uh, as uh, either. Uh, but what about static objects? Now, I, I have to say, uh, she can't, even despite the fact that she fails Goldman perimetry uh, and can't see the, the small um, uh, targets that are presented uh, all over her visual field uh, in the Goldman perimetry test, she can detect the presence of, of quite a large object, like an Ephron block, if it's uh, high contrast white, for example, on a black table top. So if we show her these Ephron blocks, uh, what can she do? Well, um, Rob Whitwell tested her when he was uh, my graduate student some years ago. Uh, and he, the first thing he did was really uh, do the world's simplest discrimination, same different. Uh, can she tell one from the other uh, when sometimes they're the same and sometimes they're different? And basically she can't, she's a chance. She can't tell them apart. Well, maybe she would do better if she had to estimate their size. Uh, and we can ask the question, like DF, would she be able to actually scale her grasp uh, to the width of these objects? So manual estimation, how does she do? Well, um, she's all over the map. She really cannot uh, uh, tell you the size of these objects by opening her index finger and thumb a matching amount. She's essentially flatlined. Now, when you ask her to reach out and grasp the object, things do improve. In fact, things tighten up quite a lot. And now we see uh, a significant slope where she's opening her hand wider as she should uh, for the wider object uh, than uh, for the smaller object. So what this seems to show is that despite the damage to V1, the visual motor system supporting grasping is still sensitive to the dimensions of all objects, even though she cannot report the width of those very objects um, that she's able to pick up or even discriminate between. But you know, what's interesting uh, about uh, MC's performance um, and indeed the performance of most people who've ever been tested on grasping with V1 lesions, that hasn't happened often, and some of them can do it, is that they're tested at the same viewing distance. So the objects are always uh, placed uh, at a certain distance away, although their sizes vary. And when you, um, uh, when you do that, you're really not pushing the system that hard because of course you're not testing what one might call grip constancy. That is, can she scale her grasp, can MC for example, scale her grasp appropriately to the size of a gold object uh, 
independent of its viewing distance because the further away it is, of course, the smaller the retinal image size. So really what I'm saying is, does MC show grip constancy or size constancy for grasping for objects uh, placed at different distances? So we all know what uh, grip constancy is. Uh, here's some famous Montreal bagels. Uh, and we see them being the same size, even though their retinal image clearly varies with the viewing distance. Now, it doesn't uh, depend on uh, the fact that you're familiar with bagels and familiar objects, although that can play a role. Um, even objects of, uh, uh, of, uh, that are novel, uh, you can perceive their real size independent of viewing distance over quite a broad uh, range of distances. In fact, um, if you have powerful distance cues, it can override familiar size. So uh, you've probably seen this kind of uh, uh, optical illusion before, uh, where uh, these SUVs are, uh, are in fact, in terms of retinal image size, identical, although the perspective cues uh, make uh, this one here look much larger than this one here. But I can assure you uh, they're the same size. But it is a very strong illusion. Now. Um, some people, uh, like the character that Hugh uh, Laurie is playing here, are clearly uh, uh, challenged when it comes to size constancy. Uh, let's have a listen. Yes, I, I, I always remember this spot because it was right here. Uh, this was the very first time that I saw my wife. Uh, was, I was standing absolutely here and I, I remember thinking, what an incredibly tiny woman she was. <laughs> absolutely tiny. She was about that size. <laughs> tiny little thing. It was only weeks later as I got to know her that I realized that, that was, of course, because she was a long way away. <laughs> so Hugh Laurie has given us uh, uh, a lesson on size constancy, um, but we also know that V1 plays an incredible role, uh, uh, some sort of role, uh, in the computation of size constancy. Uh, because uh, when you uh, do scanning studies, fMRI studies of activity in V1, it looks as though the activity is actually related to the perceived size of the object rather than the retinal image size. Um, Scott Murray uh, in Dan Kirsten's lab uh, did this uh, with, the, with the Ponzo illusion. Uh, Arendi Sprandio and Philippe Chenard uh, did it in my lab using uh, after images. Uh, and so you find that the activity, as I said, in V1 corresponds to the size you perceive, uh, not the retinal image size. And of course, this must be dependent uh, on, uh, in, uh, on input uh, uh, from uh, uh, probably a lot of down, uh, feedback uh, from higher order visual areas uh, that uh, can actually compute uh, the perspective in a scene, perhaps input uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from vergence and other cues uh, that could actually uh, reach V1. Uh, but that's going to take time. Uh, and of course, fMRI uh, has uh, a very long time constant, so you're not going to be able to see that. You're just going to see uh, things averaged over uh, the entire uh, period in which the bold response is operating. Uh, so what you need to do is EEG. And in a recent study, uh, Juan Chen, Areni Esfrandio, and Molly Henry and I showed uh, that it takes about 150 milliseconds uh, for the activity in V1 to shift from representing retinal image size to real world size. So um, is it possible, um, therefore, that MC wouldn't show size constancy when she picks up objects? After all, she's got a huge lesion of V1. But then again, perhaps script constancy and perceptual size constancy depend on different mechanisms. Uh, maybe she would show some sparing. Well, for one thing, we know uh, that after a V1 injury, uh, the projections from the eye to the pulvinar, the clicus and the pulvinar, uh, and uh, interlaminar regions of LGN, that uh, within the pulvinar, for example, uh, there are um, uh, uh, signals uh, that correspond uh, to virgins, uh, and they're similarly in the spirit colliculus. There are cells in the pulvinar that are tuned to the size of objects. We know that lesions in the pulvinar in the monkey will affect reaching behavior. So there is some possibility uh, that these computations could be done uh, outside of the uh, geniculus stripe pathway. Uh, we certainly know that in MC, MT is intact. Uh, this is a, a study carried out by Michael Arcaro and Jody um, uh, just recently. Um, and we can see that there's robust activation in MT 
even though it's right on the uh, edge of this massive lesion that she has uh, in the v in V1 and the ventral stream, uh, MT is still um, uh, going to respond um, to these moving targets uh, that are presented versus static ones. So um, to cut a long story short, Rob Whitwell, Arunis Brandio, uh, Gavin Buckingham, Philippe Chenard and I uh, went to the UK, uh, or at least they went to the UK, and they tested MC uh, in a number of different uh, uh, labs there uh, in a number of different experiments. I'm just going to talk about one. And uh, the one that um, I'm going to talk about is the one, of course, uh, that corresponds to what we have done uh, with DF. So the first thing um, that um, MC was asked to do uh, was to estimate the size of objects placed at different distances from her, these Ephron blocks, uh, where the surface areas, of course, are identical. Uh, and uh, what, um, what the control subjects in green show, of course, is size constancy, perceptual size constancy. They open their hand uh, the, uh, the, the right amount to estimate uh, the size of the object independent of its uh, viewing distance, its distance from the eye. On the other hand, MC doesn't behave that way. She opens her hand wider uh, for closer objects uh, than she does for objects that are further away. Of course, the closer they are, the bigger the retinal image. So it would appear that her default uh, is to uh, vary her manual estimations with the retinal image size rather than a computed uh, retinal image size equated for distance uh, output. So she cannot, she does not uh, integrate information about distance and retinal image size in order to report uh, the correct size of the object in this perceptual report task. But what about grasping? Now, when she reaches out to grasp the object, it's interesting, she's right in the middle of the pack. That is, uh, she shows grip constancy just like uh, the controls do, opening her hand the right amount uh, to scale for the size of the object independent uh, of viewing distance. So it looks as though perceptual size constancy and grip constancy depend on different visual pathways with only the former involving V1, at least that's what MC's data appear to show. So this suggests that size constancy and grasping, in fact, visual grasping, uh, uh, visual controller grasping in general, may involve projections from subcortical structures uh, uh, to MT and then to the dorsal stream independent uh, of V1. This is a real possibility. Uh, but to test this properly, uh, one needs to do work uh, with animal models. So the model that recently uh, I have been working with in collaboration with James Bourne, uh, with the Bourne Group at uh, Monash University, uh, is uh, the common marmoset, uh, who shows uh, excellent grasping of food um, uh, without uh, uh, any uh, difficult training. And so uh, here, uh, for example, um, Dylan Fox, who was James' uh, graduate student, uh, he's a real marmoset whisperer, uh, works well, uh, gets these animals to do all kinds of things. And here we see a cage in which there's a hole either very close to one wall or the other, forcing the animal, if he's going to pick up a piece of food, uh, to use either his right hand or his left. Uh, and here you see uh, the hand uh, reaching out to pick up this piece of food, which we can vary in size. And we have markers on the finger and thumb using a GoPro. Uh, and that acts as a kind of proxy uh, grip aperture for the entire hand because it's a, a, an open hand grasp, but it's not a precision grasp. And what you can see uh, is that indeed uh, the marmoset does scale uh, its grasping hand to the size of the piece of food it's confronted with. So, um, these, these are early days. Um, we haven't uh, completely addressed uh, the questions that we want to uh, address, uh, but we're making some progress. So um, the first thing to know uh, is that uh, in a series of, of experiments, uh, uh, Bourne and his uh, colleagues, James and his colleagues have shown uh, that the pathway from the eye to the pulvinar is very important for sort of setting up the dorsal stream so that animals who have lesions uh, in the dorsal stream have sorry, have lesions in the inferior parts of the pulvinar, uh, have a disorganized uh, dorsal stream. Uh, so if you inject, for example, in uh, one pulvinar, in one side of the brain, uh, in, a, in an infant uh, marmoset, uh, a neurotoxin, uh, what you can see is that uh, in the adult brain, uh, when that animal grows up, 
Uh, the dorsal stream connections with MT are essentially absent, uh, but they're well developed, obviously, on the control side. And remarkably, uh, when you test the uh, contralesional or the ipsilesional limb, uh, what you see is that the contralesional limb to the uh, disorganized uh, dorsal stream shows a much wider grasp uh, more, uh, more often uh, than the other hand, as though uh, uh, the animal were behaving like a patient with a posterior parietal cortical lesion who splays their fingers uh, when they reach out to pick up an object. And you can see this here in this uh, video where there's a contrast between uh, the uh, uh, ipsilesional hand uh, and the um, contralesional hand in two different animals. And what you can see is that the um, hand contralateral to the lesion opens up much wider uh, and is, more, is far less certain of where it's going and shows a much uh, um, bigger grip aperture uh, than uh, the hand uh, that's contralateral to the intact um, uh, dorsal stream. So this is a great model uh, for looking at the role of the dorsal stream uh, in the control of grasping uh, in the marmoset monkey. Uh, and um, future studies then will enable us to uh, sort of address this geniculostriate question about how important it is uh, by making um, temporary lesions of the pulvinar uh, and or the lateral geniculate nucleus uh, and looking at the effects on perception and grasping in adult uh, marmosets using dreads or optogenetics. Um, and um, you know, James Bourne and his colleagues are moving forward on that front. But you know, other work from the Bourne lab has uh, implications for our understanding of the effects of early life lesions on D1 um, on visual abilities and, and the sparing of those abilities as well. So uh, beautiful work uh, from Claire Warner, uh, whose thesis I, super, uh, I examined actually after uh, she did this beautiful work that was published in Current Biology. Um, she uh, and, and James showed that early life uh, lesions of V1 uh, actually um, result in less pruning uh, of the pathway uh, from, the, uh, from the eye uh, to the inferior pulvinar uh, in these monkeys with D1 lesions, even though uh, the retinal input to LGN, of course, degenerates completely after these uh, very early D1 lesions. And so this uh, you know, gives us an opportunity uh, to uh, really try and apply this story uh, to explain uh, the behavior of patients who receive damage uh, to V1 early in life. I mean, it's a, it's a very well-known story that people who have damage to V1 early on much more likely to show blind sight uh, than uh, are people who have uh, lesions uh, uh, post puberty, for example. So recently, uh, we had a chance to look uh, at a young child. Um, we tested uh, uh, him when he was seven years old, uh, but just shortly after birth, uh, he uh, developed, uh, he, because of a, a problem with medium chain uh, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency, he had developed uh, hypoglycemia and suffered a lot of seizures. And when uh, an MR was taken a number of years later, um, it was very clear uh, that uh, uh, the VI had massive bilateral lesions of V1 and V2 extending anteriorly. We, uh, uh, BI uh, is an Australian uh, child. Uh, he and his family came to Canada to visit relatives and they visited my lab and we tested them. Uh, tested him. And what we found was not only uh, he, he was far beyond blind sight, he had extensive conscious visual abilities. Uh, he's not blind. Uh, he can use vision to navigate uh, the hallways and not bump into things. Uh, he can pick up objects uh, uh, dexterously. He plays video games on an iPad. Uh, he can identify uh, quite consciously uh, different emotional expressions uh, on people's faces. He can identify colors. Uh, he can even read large letters uh, of the alphabet. So if text is large, he, has, uh, he, can, re he can read. This is work uh, I did in association with uh, Mark Joannis uh, in, uh, at Western. So he went back to Australia and James was able to pop him in the scanner and have a look uh, at the tracks uh, from subcortical regions to the cerebral hemispheres uh, in BI. Uh, and uh, this was um, uh, diffusion tractography, of course, uh, looking at projections from LGN to uh, V1, uh, from LGN uh, to MT, and from 
the inferior pulvinar, the medial part of the inferior pulvinar uh, to MT. So what you can see uh, in these uh, age match control kids uh, is that there are very robust uh, projections from LGN uh, to V1, uh, these, these blue tracks here, that are entirely absent, uh, almost entirely absent uh, in BI. Uh, however, uh, in, uh, in BI, who has these large lesions of V1, uh, there are um, uh, projections uh, from the inferior pulvinar uh, to MT and indeed from LGN to MT. And indeed, uh, if you uh, actually count the, the tracks, um, uh, what you can see uh, is that there's essentially nothing, uh, a, a tiny, tiny uh, a fraction of, of inputs going to these lesions uh, in uh, V1 uh, in, uh, in patient BI as compared to the controls. But in fact, uh, particularly in the left hemisphere, uh, there is an, an increase in the number of projections uh, from the inferior pulvinar to MT that may be helping uh, support uh, uh, the, uh, the, the residual visual, considerable uh, uh, residual visual abilities uh, in BI. So it kind of comes full circle. Uh, this, this pulvinar relay then could be uh, a neural pathway that affords uh, a number of these preserved visual capacities that we see after this early life lesion of V1. Uh, perhaps projections as well uh, to uh, other areas and uh, uh, visual areas in the cerebral cortex as well. We don't know the source of the input uh, to the pulvinar and the LGN, whether it's coming from the eye or from the colliculus. We don't know that yet. Um, but in any case, I think it does corroborate uh, this earlier anatomical evidence from the Bourne lab showing an enhanced uh, uh, inferior pulvinar, um, pulvinar projection to MT uh, after an early life lesion of V1. So where are we now? We've shown uh, that neuropsychological case studies, uh, particularly when they're combined with neuroimaging, can provide important insights into the functional organization of the human brain. And I think this is particularly true when we test patients with known lesions on a whole range of tasks under uh, a, a range of different uh, viewing conditions and so on. Moreover, um, as our own work with DF and MC and BI has shown, uh, the findings from case studies can provide uh, new directions for parallel work uh, in animal models, and of course, vice versa. So uh, that's my story for today. Uh, and it remains uh, for me only uh, to uh, thank uh, the many people uh, who, uh, who uh, did all the hard work that, uh, that uh, uh, that led to, to these findings. And uh, I'm very grateful and have enjoyed working with all of them, uh, particularly with David Milner, my longtime colleague, with whom I have worked for 50 years. I can't believe 50 years that we've worked together. I've known him longer than I've known my wife. Um, I met him in 71 in St. Andrews. And of course, I also have to uh, thank you uh, and thank also uh, the uh, agencies that have supported this work uh, over the last uh, uh, couple of decades. Uh, uh, both in Canada and in the UK and, and in Australia as well. Uh, thanks so much for listening.